tonight, laser mapping of our massive coastline. And the truth about flying frogs revealed. Hello and welcome to Quantum. We'll come to those stories a little later in the program, but first to a remarkable tale of medical experimentation. Medical science is different from other areas of research. When you're dealing with people, you can't endanger their lives just to prove a theory. Yet, sometimes, a dangerous experiment may yield enormously valuable information. The solution for one group of scientists was to put their own lives at risk to find answers. In the intensive care units and operating theatres around the world, there are literally millions of people each year uh, are fully paralysed. And we don't have a lot of information about what sort of things those people are feeling. This is the highest level of care that the medical system can give you. The people here at Prince Henry Hospital are so ill that they will need constant care and attention from the medical staff. In some cases, they'll need machines to perform even the most basic of tasks, breathing. This man also needs a machine to breathe for him, but he's not sick. Maximal inspiration he has now. volunteered Maximal to be paralysed as part of a daunting but vital experiment into the causes of breathlessness. Perhaps surprisingly, doctors aren't sure what it means when someone says they're feeling breathless. It could mean simply that their lungs have been working overtime and they feel that they're not keeping up with the pace. But then again, it might be a warning, a signal coming directly from the body to indicate that it's not getting the air it needs, that its air supply is somehow compromised. Now, one of these explanations is probably correct, but doctors need to know which one. At the back of the throat. There's fine. something flowing in my left nostril, guys. That's okay. okay. Dr. Simon Gandivia wants to find the answer the hard way. He and a team from the Prince of Wales Medical Research Unit have been planning this experiment for well over a year. But it's not the first time it's been done. Nearly 30 years ago, a Canadian physiologist named Campbell performed the same experiment on himself. Breathlessness, he concluded, was just a sensation, the result of lungs being pushed to the limit. Well, from that moment, medical textbooks and general practice took his findings on board and promptly discarded all other possible explanations. But after a few years, some doctors began to have doubts until in 1989, an American research team decided to repeat Campbell's controversial experiment. Their results, the complete opposite. They concluded that breathlessness had nothing to do with the lungs. It was, according to them, a direct response to rising carbon dioxide levels in the blood. So. Who was right? Breathing not only gives us the oxygen we need, but it also purges the body of waste carbon dioxide. As carbon dioxide levels rise in our blood, we automatically breathe faster to get rid of it. That much is certain. The controversy surrounds what sometimes happens next. When we find ourselves in a situation where we can't get rid of the carbon dioxide fast enough, the lungs are working flat out, but it's not sufficient. Tiny sensors in our brain register the climbing carbon dioxide level. We say we're feeling breathless. But is it the straining lungs or the sensors in the brain that make us feel that way? Was Campbell correct or the Americans? The experiment clearly needed to be repeated, but this time so as to leave no doubt whatsoever. There's only one way to do that, and it's not simple. You need to raise the level of carbon dioxide in someone's blood, but at the same time prevent them from breathing any faster. To achieve that means paralysing them completely, even their breathing mechanism. Anything down that nostril at all? There we go. The accuracy demanded by such an experiment depends totally on the subject's ability not only to endure the nightmarish horrors of being conscious while paralysed, 
but also to be informed enough to describe precisely the physiological changes occurring within your own body. On the back side gang. The only people who can measure up to such rigorous standards were themselves. Simon isn't the only guinea pig. Keep breathing through the nose. Two other members of the team, Kieran and David, have already been through the same experience, but it's not the kind of experiment you rush into. Once we had got to the stage of getting approval from the ethics committee, uh, all the subjects uh, underwent extensive uh, training in situations where we tried to mimic everything that would go on in the operating theatre uh, so that the subjects knew exactly what was going to happen at any moment. We had a script that was rehearsed. Concentrate on your breathing. Relax and concentrate on your breathing. Paralysis in our willing victim will be induced by a curare-like drug. But once you're 100% paralysed, you can still think, but you can't talk. So how can you possibly communicate? Are you ready to start? I will now inflate the cuff. The answer is to wrap a pressure cuff around one arm before the infusion of curare, so that the supply of blood is effectively cut off. The arm will not be paralysed, and Simon will communicate with the other team members by the use of hand signals, but only for 20 minutes. After that, the muscles in the arm will run out of oxygen and fail to perform. I will now begin the infusion. Cuff Using an relax. ingenious system of structured responses known as the Borg scale, Simon will be able Very to describe well. precisely how he feels at any time during the procedure. Signal if you're okay. Signal's good. More than Very meters well. and sensors, the this communication fine. by hand signal will form the central piece of evidence slight. in the experiment. That's a slight. Just waiting for your heart rate to come under control. Standing next to the freshly paralysed Simon, David McKenzie recalled the awesome sensation of his own experience the day before. As the infusion began, I thought, I'm entering uh, an unknown world here. I had no worries about my personal safety because I knew that my chance of dying from this was zero but um, it was just the fear of the unknown that uh, allowed my anxiety to rise blood pressure's fine saturation the fine. paralysis came on very quickly within perhaps now. two minutes and uh, i thought my goodness that was quick and tried to move an arm and uh, this is it i'm paralyzed what should i do now nothing Concentrate on the ventilator. Is it enough? And people were talking to me saying, you know, is everything okay? And I'm signaling, yes, everything's okay. Just relax. Everything's going very well. Suddenly all that anxiety just left and I, and I felt totally calm and thought, right, let's get on with the experiment. The actual experiment will be run three times. In each, the levels of carbon dioxide being fed into Simon's lungs are controlled. He'll be totally unaware of the gas mix on each occasion. All he can do is respond to how he feels and communicate this via the Borg scale. Signal if you're okay. Signal's fine. Indicating that he feels severe discomfort will be interpreted as being breathless. If sensors in the brain are involved, he should register more and more discomfort as the carbon dioxide levels rise. But if it's really the lungs, then he should feel no discomfort at all. The ventilator prevents them from being overexerted. On this first run, the mixture is laced with more carbon dioxide than normal. Doing very well. Moderate, somewhat severe. Severe. Is that a severe? That's the severe. It's now severe. Breathe with the ventilator. Simon's oh. indication that he feels severe discomfort in breathing means that he has, in fact, detected the rising carbon dioxide levels. The only way he could have done that is if the receptors in his brain are telling him a direct response. Signal if you're okay. Are you okay? Signal's fine. 
everyone is delighted and relieved. The experiment has run without a hitch. In just 12 minutes, a medical argument that's dragged on for years has been settled. Want the cuff let down? Yes. Yes. Cuff's coming down now. Now the pressure cuff will be released and Simon's arm, like the rest of his body, will be paralysed. He won't be able to communicate at all now, but the effects of the drug should start to wear off after another 30 minutes or so. Done very well. At the moment, I'm not planning to do the same experiment next week. It doesn't mean that there aren't some aspects of this study to do with carbon dioxide levels and paralysis that won't be worth pursuing uh, in a year or more's time. But I think, for me, the book's closed on one small question. Many more of them still remain to be looked at in the future.